Well, we are live now, and uh, I know I did see Brian Cobb's uh, oh. uh, name go by, so I think he's tuning in. In fact, I think he's uh, hosted his own uh, watch party, so uh, I think we might be hearing from some alums today. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. thanks uh -huh. everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Mark David Obenza, host of this Choir Nerd podcast, and I'm happy to have my former professor, uh, music theory extraordinaire, Jonathan Bernard, today. Um, thanks so much, Jonathan, for being on the podcast. Delighted to be here. So I think a lot of people will uh, that know me will probably know of you or maybe have worked with you. Um, but uh, just briefly, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, where did you study and what brought you into the uh, music theory world? Well, OK. Um, uh, I think this must have started, well, it did. Of course, it started uh, a long time ago. Uh, I've always been kind of interested in how uh, pieces are, pieces of music are put together uh, and how one might uh, deal with the, how, how one might uh, 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 approach them afterwards, even if it turns out to be a way that the composer hadn't been uh, uh, Fully conscious of when he or she wrote the wrote the piece, uh, this was a very vague uh, interest in my high school days. When I first got to college, I think my idea was that I wanted to be a composer. Uh, that that seemed that seemed like a, a reasonable route. But uh, the curriculum where I went, a uh, little, little place called Harvard College. Uh, 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 it was so conservative that I think it it pretty much beat it out of me, beat out of any any interest that I uh, that I had from that point on in being a composer. It just didn't it didn't sim simply didn't seem to suit my skill set at least as the uh, as the uh, uh, curriculum there evaluated it. And more and more, uh, more and more, I got interested in in music theory without really knowing whether it was a real field, whether it was something that I could do, whether I'd have to become, for example, go into historical musicology instead to pursue an interest like that. But as I uh, approached graduation uh, and applied to graduate programs, I did find one at Yale that seemed to be qu quite strictly defined as a as a theory program not having anything to do with composition and not necessarily anything to do with historical musicology either it was really run by one guy and that that guy was alan fort who turned out to be my eventually my uh, mentor my dissertation advisor mm -hmm. and so that's that's really where where it happened uh and where i I got my ideas. We can I can talk later about how the field has changed yeah. since then. But it was in very, very, it was in a very uh, uh, protean state, I guess you could say. At that point, there really wasn't a lot. That, music theory as a field, na uh, nationwide or even worldwide, had really very little visibility. Uh, the people who taught theory uh, at the undergraduate level, uh, which was basically where theory fit into the academy were generally either composers or sometimes music historians. Hmm. Uh, they, uh, there, there was no separate faculty for uh, theory instruction at most schools. Uh, there, there, were, there were a couple that, had, that were maybe exceptions to that. Uh, I had the feeling that most of them were renegades from music ed. Uh, yeah. that that's, that's really actually where they where they came from. You know, people who took an interest in uh, in music uh, music education at uh, uh, the, at the at institutions of higher learning, rather than which is what most music ed programs focus on the L high uh, level. Okay, okay. you you had mentioned. Harvard being conservative musically, can you say more about that? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, in my freshman year, there was a huge uh, uh, uproar 
on campus, which eventually led to the resignation of the then uh, president of the of the university, and <clears throat> this this was largely a political uh, matter, as often, things often were in the late '60s. Uh, but it had some spillover effect in terms of making many undergraduates interested in uh, curricular reform, because there was a perception in many areas that the curriculum was kind of hidebound and it hadn't been hadn't been uh, worked on, hadn't been thought about as a uh, 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 in terms of perhaps ways it should change or could change uh, as time has go had gone on. So uh, some of the music majors had a meeting with, uh, the, uh, with the faculty to talk about this and, and ask various questions about, well, could we do this, could we do that? And the same answer came back every time from this, this uh, uh, really, uh, um, uh, this guy who was close to retirement, uh, a fellow named Tillman Merritt, who was the uh, chair of the department at that time. His specialty was 16th century polyphony. And oh, uh, he's you know, a okay. historian, yeah. And, and every time something was proposed, the same answer came back. He said, but this is Harvard. <laughs> wow every time every time and, and eventually we got the message that there's not going to be any change this is the way this is the way things are so you know my it didn't dissuade me from being a music major although perhaps it should have at that point maybe what i should have done is what uh, i've found quite a few people have done when they've been stuck in in uh a curricula like that, major in something else and just take the minimum number of music courses that will that would qualify them for advanced study. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do that. I I stuck with the stuck with the major and got out of it what I could. And actually I got quite a bit out of it in the end. A very, very traditional training. Um, I had a, a harmony teacher in in my first year who we used to call America's answer to Nadia Boulanger. She was really, she was, she was really of the old French school. I mean, uh -huh. there was no question about it. We, we, uh, we were all directed to spend hours in the in the basement of of the music building, which was a grim location, I can tell you. Uh, and these little these little practice rooms, working through uh, uh, figured bass, uh, and these uh -huh. figured these this these figured basses were uh, all composed by a guy named Vidal, no relation to Gore Vidal, I am sure. Um, uh, and uh, they, they're all from the late 19th century, these, these Vidal bases with what they were called. And they were these crazy things that had, you know, you'd, you'd play through them and they had no particular relation to any kind of music you'd ever heard in your life. Uh, and, the, and this was deliberate. Because what the aim was was to just get you to realize those figures, no matter what, no matter no matter what they produced. And there was no upper line, no 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 like solo uh, line to guide uh, to guide you at all. You simply had to figure it out on the, uh, as it were, on the on the spot, uh -huh. uh, without any without any context really at all. Uh, this was this was you know in a way this was useful training but it was also kind of weird because it didn't it didn't really educate the student in how uh, any plausible kind of music should sound um, yeah yeah our the rest of our training was really basically aimed at uh, enabling us to kind of uh, fake a Bach chorale style so you know, yeah. that that was pretty much the final exercise for the whole year. Uh, yeah, what, what, like what, forgists, like a yeah. forgist of some kind. Like a what? Like a forgist, like a like an art forger. Uh, oh yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the better you the better you were at it, you know, the, uh, you know, the higher grade you got. You yeah, know? I remember having to do that. Um, I think we did that with fugues at some point in college. I think uh, with I had Diane um, Thome. Oh yeah. Diane Thome. Uh, and we had to do, we had to 
Yeah, make our own fugues, basically. Oh boy, yeah, um, that, that's the yeah, that's the toughest thing to do. I, yeah. yeah, when I took counterpoint, I don't think I don't think he tried. I don't think the teacher tried to to uh, get us to do anything better than a, a two part invention. No, three part three part invention. Excuse oh, me. Okay. That's what it was. Yeah. So, <laughs> at some point, you. So have you composed anything? I mean, did you did you sort of let that go? I did early I did. on. Yeah, no, no. I uh, yeah. I think I took one course from someone who shouldn't have been permitted to teach it uh, in tonal in what was called tonal composition. Oh. Uh, he was he was really quite hopeless. I'm not even going to mention his name. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he's 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 long since. Uh, uh, beyond the reach of further questions, as we say, uh, so there's no there's no reason to right. <laughs> worry about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, he meant well, but it, it just wasn't wasn't working out terribly well. Um, um, actually, my counterpoint course with a, with a composer, this was a, a composer named David Del Tredici, someone whose name uh, you may very well know, uh, who started out. This is an interesting thing. He started out as a you know, a modernist, you might say, a, a really modernist style composer. Uh, some of his early pieces are actually quite interesting, and quite quite uh, fascinating. But then right around the time that I graduated, as it happened, okay. he got on, he changed, everything changed for him. He got fascinated with the, with Lewis Carroll uh, uh, stories from Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and started writing a whole series, as it turned out, a whole series of pieces based on the texts in those Carroll, those Lewis Carroll books. And that became kind of the gateway to his new, much more conservative and uh, much more uh, tonally oriented style, which I guess persists to this day. I haven't heard anything from him recently. Uh -huh. uh, Another another uh, important uh, influence, though, was a course I took with a then brand new uh, junior faculty member at uh, at Harvard, a composer named Fred Lairdahl, who now teaches at Columbia. He's he, but he he started at Harvard, uh -huh. uh, and we worked through a, a good deal of, in this seminar, which was basically a graduate course, which. Uh, which college seniors were permitted to take if they had the if they'd finished everything else. Uh, we worked through a good deal of the of Schoenberg's um, Book of the Hanging Gardens and Five Pieces for Orchestra, and then went on to to uh, study more recent works by um, people like Boulez and Messiaen. Uh -huh. And this this really, even though the experience was sort of frustrating because we didn't have any real tools. To work with, we were we were you know it was basically this kind of seat of the pants kind of analysis where you, where you try to make some sense of what was going on, but more or less using ad hoc methods. And this con convinced me that this was a kind of study that was something that could really fascinate me because I've always loved puzzles. This is one thing about being a music theorist. If, if you don't, if you don't, in, if, if you don't really uh, cotton to that, if you don't really love puzzle solving, probably it's probably not quite the field for you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and that sort of segues nicely to my next question, which I think uh, many people, um, our musicians probably that follow that are probably watching, um, but just what would you say? What is music theory, and what does a music theorist do? Oh yeah, okay. Well, uh, um, it, it, it the answer to that is it it depends on it it, it depends on a lot of factors actually. As music theory has changed, I know this is this is coming up as a question too. Uh, it's changed a lot since I first went into it in the when I first arrived at Yale in the early '70s. Uh, this was uh, it. It really it really has changed a great deal. But I'll talk about what it is now. Uh, if you're a, if you're a faculty member in in field of music theory on a, in a school of music or a department of music. Or a conservatory, 
there are uh, uh, several different things that you're probably going to be called upon to do. Mm -hmm. okay, this is the teaching part. Um, first of all, you're probably going to, to teach some un introductory undergraduate courses. And as things stand right now, because there hasn't been any, uh, any radical uh, curriculum reform uh, yet, though it seems as though this might be on the horizon for a lot of schools, uh, uh, is basic harmony and counterpoint according to the uh, the uh, uh, strictures of common practice. And common practice is generally defined as the period very roughly from Bach to Brahms, uh, omitting, strategically omitting some of the more radical uh, practitioners of composition from the late 19th century, because that seems to lead to another line of, another area of development entirely, namely the 20th century. But Brahms is pretty much the, pretty much the end of the line as far as, uh, as common practice goes. So mm -hmm. basic, basic harmony and counterpoint uh, for as many semesters or quarters as the curriculum permits. And it used to permit a lot more. This is one thing that's kind of hamstrung a lot of a lot of theory faculty is that there's been so much pressure on music curricula to get to accommodate more and more different interests and more and more different um, um, specialized studies that uh, the core these core uh, uh, curricula have had to shrink. Uh, at Eastman, uh, East, at the Eastman School of Music, they seem to have resisted this successfully up to this point. They still require four years of this kind of study of their undergraduates. But it's slowly, when I first came here in 1987 to the University of Washington, it was three years. But now it's down to two and a third. And it may be about to shrink further. I don't, I don't really know exactly what is going to happen in the next few years because we're under some, some very, very rigid uh, constraints right now. Yeah. But, but this is typical. This is, this is happening everywhere that there's a certain amount of shrinkage. So we're, we're asked to do more with less, uh, less available uh, course time uh, to, to take care of it. Another thing that you will probably do if you're a theory teacher at the undergraduate level is uh, uh, teach musicianship. And so if you don't have graduate students around to handle it, uh, you teach sight singing and dictation, as well as the written skills that go with learning basic harmony and, and counterpoint, perhaps taught from a, from a, uh, a species uh, uh, standpoint, or perhaps not. I can I can talk about what species counterpoint is later on if anybody's really interested. <laughs> in that. Uh, um, uh, but but counterpoint basically is taught in two two different ways. One is through the, the species approach, and the other is simply as style emulation, style imitation, so that you learn how to how to write counterpoint in say a uh, 16th century polyphon poly polyphonic style. Mm -hmm. Or you learn to you learn to uh, to emulate, or as we sometimes say, fake uh, a box style uh, uh, by writing uh, inventions and fugues and so on. Okay, so that's so that's the undergraduate teaching, uh, uh, core teaching, and then there are of course the upper upper level electives, which go which which I also teach. Uh huh. Uh, uh, um, Introduct which are introductions to um, advanced analytical techniques. Uh, the basic division here, again, is between uh, study of common practice, the common practice period, which still looms very large in most schools of music. Mo many students who, who uh, elect a music performance major are studying, uh, basically they're studying core curriculum. Uh, they're, they're studying, I'm sorry, they're studying common practice repertoire. So, so this is music that is very important to them and it's very important to their teachers. And so we keep this in play uh, pretty much out of necessity. 
even uh-huh. even if even if as in my case it's not my research specialty i don't i don't publish on um on common practice music really uh, i don't i don't do i don't do any work in that area at all right uh, so just just very quickly we had a couple questions fly in uh yeah, do, I see, do that. You see them do you, do you want to respond to them the first one was from brian cobb um about uh, earlier, you were talking about uh, the about Lerdahl. Yeah, Lerdahl. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sure. Hello, Brian. Um, uh, I tonal timbral hierarchies. Uh, he had just published. Uh, well, at the time of my studies with him, no, he had published very little. Uh, in fact, uh, this was 1971, 72. That's how far back I go. Uh, 71, 72, uh, and he was just out of Berkeley, I think, is where he got his degree. Or, uh, I think Princeton and Berkeley were both places he'd been. And I remember him in his first, very first lecture to us, ranting and raving about how terrible uh, Schenker was. Uh, as a uh, as an approach to tonal music, this is the theories of Heinrich Schenker, which uh, are now under fire from a very yeah. different direction. Yeah, this is very recent history now. But at the time, uh, he was convinced that this was a, this was not the way to go. Hmm. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, ten years later, he teamed up with a a a, a, a professor of linguistics at Brandeis and. Co-wrote, co-wrote a book uh, which was called the uh, generative theory of tonal music, which actually owes a lot to Shankarian thinking, but it, but it uh, um, configures it in a very different way. Uh, that's kind of, that that is kind of interesting. The Tambral Hierarchies came, uh, um, publication came quite a bit later after that. Uh, uh, he he he's a very he's a very interesting musical thinker and I think also a very interesting composer though I haven't heard any of his really recent music. Uh-huh. Uh, but no, I don't I don't at the time at the time we were all we were all this was this was a a, a long time ago before there was really any uh, definable um, um, field of uh, of music theory uh per se mm. so we were all just kind of trying stuff out now, i remember i remember the seminar that i had with him uh uh we the the few of us who are undergraduates were in there with all these all these graduate students that so we were all kind of kind of intimidated we didn't really want to say much of anything the, uh, but they were they would all sit there um some of them, some of them smoking pipes. This was this was, this was the big thing to do at the, at the time, smoking pipes and looking very profound, but not <laughs> saying much of anything. They finally realized they don't know any more than we do. <laughs> they, they haven't got they haven't got a clue. So we we just kind of let let Fred talk, you know. And uh-huh. so and and that was interesting enough because it, because he's quite a he's quite a he's quite an interesting musical thinker. Okay. And, uh, and you know, I've, I'm always been interested to see what what he's uh, working on. After the generative theory of tonal music, he published another uh, book called Tonal Pitch Space. I'm just looking up on my shelves to see. Yes, sit, it's sitting right there, uh, and, which I used as the basis for a, a seminar here at the UW um, some years ago. It was very, very uh, fertile uh, kind of uh, yeah, for, kind of work. I don't think he ever carried that timbral hierarchies study beyond the, the scope of an article, but um, uh, I could be I could be uh, wrong about that. Hmm. And then one from Jin Shiel. Uh, okay. How, let me just read this out loud here for because there'll be an audio only version of this released. Um, how has the tendency of contemporary composition to revert not only back to tonality, but somewhat simpler harmonic patterns and progressions affected music theorists? Wow. Okay. I mean, let me read that over again. Yeah, I'll, me too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. 
that's a that's a actually that's a great question, and um, it it uh, feeds into something else I wanted to say about how the field has changed mm -hmm. in the time I've been uh, involved with it. Uh, at the time when I first started my study, uh, there were two main things that uh, that we were expected to master uh, before qualifying to to uh, enter the dissertation stage. And one of them was Shankarian analysis, which applies only to music from 1700 to 1900, basically. Uh, and the other was uh, the theory of pitch class sets uh, with maybe a little bit of study of 12 tone uh, theory on the side, though uh, Fort himself did not, um, my teacher, Alan Fort did not, emphasize that very much. He wasn't particularly interested in 12-tone uh, theory, but he was very interested in the atonal repertoire as construed in various different ways, not simply Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern before they all became 12-tone composers, but also um, certain work of Stravinsky and Bartok and potentially other 20th century composers. But as time has gone on and uh, we see uh, movements like minimalism enter the picture. Uh, uh, theorists, theorists have gravitated to the study of other areas. And this, this has meant that, first of all, the repertorial uh, uh, purview of, of the music theorist and analyst, um, really the two go hand in hand, is now far larger than it was in you know in my time as a graduate student mm -hmm. uh, we've all we've all had to to watch this and and understand that it's uh, that it, it has drawn uh, energies away from what uh what, what used to be kind of the 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 core the, the sine qua non of of uh, theory and uh analysis as, as defined in those days, people used to make fun of it. In fact, we called it sets and shanker uh, as a, as a you know as a, as a feel. This was something that that, that uh, used to be used to be said uh, uh, usually usually by people who disparage the field because during you know during uh, my early years in the field, this was this was when the National Theory Society was formed and split off. From the American Musicological Society, where which used to be the only learned, uh, uh, only learned society for people in musicology, uh, the, the College Music Society plays a role as well, but it's that that has a very very strong focus on pedagogy mainly. And that's really that's really what they do. So if you, if you have defined your role in whatever school you teach as basically a, an instructor, a, a pedagogue, and not, not really a researcher, then that's a, that's a society you might belong to. But, the, uh, but uh, people like, like Alan Fort and some of his uh, uh, colleagues in other places got kind of fed up with the kind of, of – uh, uh, the lack of interest that the that the musicologists seem to have in uh, in specifically music theory study, and so they decided to form their own society, and, and so this this led eventually to a great proliferation of different interests under the umbrella of of music theory. So we have uh, one indicator of that is special interest groups within the society and they they really have proliferated in all kinds of directions we have music theory and mathematics we have music theory and philosophy we have a special interest group in the history of music theory which has always been a big topic mm -hmm. the, the, the what passes for the intellectual history of our discipline which is actually very interesting because it goes way back it goes back before there was even such a thing as musicology Mm -hmm. uh, for historical musicology, which didn't really get a start till the 18th century. But music theory goes back to the ancient Greeks. 
that and, and, and stretches from there to to the present day. Uh, so so, but to get back to the the the, uh, uh, the original question about uh, the interest in uh, tonal music, yes, there are. Well, there's there's a very big contingent of within the society that uh, um, has a burning interest in popular music. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we also have, a, we have one in jazz and we have one more specifically in, in pop. Um, and uh, I myself have published some uh, in that area, uh, some uh, couple of, well, let's see, I guess, I guess three, I'd say three different articles that all touch on popular music in various different ways. One, one that's entirely devoted to it. Another, exploring the, the uh, the interface between minimalism and pop, mm -hmm. and and then another one more recently. My most recent one uh, in this, in this uh, realm is an article which I called "The Aesthetics of Drone." Uh, and drone is a specific uh, kind of approach to music, which which bridges um, what we now what we would call art music and uh, and pop. Uh, both there's interest in it on both sides, and it is leading. It's one of the factors I think which is leading to a kind of a breakdown between the uh, between the two. Uh, what would I call them? The two practices of of music. There are there are a lot of musicians working these days whose activities really can't be classified as either art or pop. That old that old very rigid distinction, which existed until recently, is really showing some signs of breaking down quite uh, quite drastically. Uh huh. So that's one thing, yeah, that has definitely happened, and I've got a lot of I've got a lot of kindred spirits out there who have interests uh, uh, that are similar to mine. Yeah, quick shout out from Mark Powell. Who uh, do you, do you remember, Mark Powell? I, you... I do. Yes, Mark Powell uh, uh, had a very big interest in Arvo Pert, as I recall. Is that yeah. am well, I right? Am I Mark Powell here. It, yeah. The marks are into Arvo Pert, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he's a executive director uh, with the uh, Capella Romana. A, uh, oh, there he is. Okay, yeah, drones. Yeah, Greek. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting co uh, connection to make. Yeah, uh, I I actually don't know. It's a Greek. The if you mean ancient Greeks, yeah, uh, there he is. That's me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, ancient Greek. I don't. I don't know anything about ancient. But I don't think. I don't think many. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows that much about ancient Greek music. There are very few sources, and it's very. It's difficult to tell exactly what uh, was going on there. Uh -huh. I, I had a friend. I had a friend who uh, who uh, years ago uh, uh, took a trip with his wife to to Greece. Uh -huh. And I said, and he said he was going to visit the Oracle at Delphi. So, so I said to him, "Okay, here's a question for you. You can ask the Oracle, what were the tonoi exactly? Uh, uh, these these mysterious scales that were were tuned tuned to uh, to different uh, series of intervals within a fixed range." Uh, uh, he said he didn't get an answer. When he got back, he said, he said the oracle was silent on this. On this, uh, so so I can't tell you anything about about the, about the ancient Greeks. I don't I don't know whether drone played a role in, in that music or not. But it's very it's it's an interesting development because uh, because for uh, if if you've studied Indian music or if you've ever heard any Indian music, that is to say from from India, uh, you know that uh, drone plays a, uh, an important role in raga, mm -hmm. uh, but it's background. It's the it's the kind of the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the hue uh, or the color of 
the, of the musical environment against which the, the soloist works. And so it stands really, it, it is like the, the field, the, back, the, the, the background against which the, the, the figure is, go, is going on. But in, in the practices of drone, uh, the, the sustained tones become the foreground. That's, that's all there is. Uh, this is very different, in fact, uh, from from uh, uh, from musical practices of that kind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is it, it's a kind of a radical thing to do. We used to have someone on our faculty here who uh, who was a member of the, of the deep listening band. Some of some of the listeners may have heard of deep listening. Uh, <clears throat> this was a group that got its name from from literally deep listening. They went and recorded in, in a disused water cistern on the premises of Fort Warden State Park out in Port Townsend, Washington, uh, <clears throat> which um, I don't know how they discovered this or how they got, or even how they got permission to use it, uh, but it's this vast underground space with a tremendously long reverberation time. Yeah, um, how long? Yeah. How long? Yeah, how long? How long was the reverberation time? 45 seconds. Yeah, wow. Make one sound and hear it for that long without any, without amplification, without any kind of, of uh, uh, artificial uh, enhancement, nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they recorded uh, music down there in that cistern and released it on new albion records and the, yeah so this is part of the part of the drone aesthetic pauline oliveros was another member of this group uh, she and she and stuart dempster were the were the ringleaders i guess you could say <clears throat> and this has had some spillover effect into uh pop as well and some kind of mutual feedback, uh, much as what happened with minimalism when when uh, pop musicians got interested in in minimalism, as they started to do very early on. Uh, I would say by in some cases by the early 70s, uh, this this eventually had some uh, effect on on uh, the on the original minimalists themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is part again part of the whole pr uh, process of breaking down uh, divisions. Yeah, I want to I want to pivot uh, back to college music programming, if that's all right with you. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just yeah, like. how does student interest affect uh, the music curriculum in college? Can it have an effect? Um, I know you were talking earlier about undergrad having these core and I, I remember this too having these core classes that um, are very kind of western music focused um i on some level i always think of the university and even the music school as a business and on some some level you have to attract um, customers and the students um that might be wanting to join 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 the study and i'm wondering um you know, is how does how has student um, interest affected curriculum if it has um, on a core level, undergrad core le level, or or a graduate level? Mm. Like, do do you feel like you know? I guess on the graduate level, maybe students sign up mainly to study with specific professors at a college. Would you say that's right? Study. Um, study if, if they want to be music majors at all. You mean that that, that, that they're uh, attracted to specific teachers? Yeah, well, I think that's true in performance. Yeah, I think that I think that uh, yeah, a person who comes to well, say the University of Washington, wishing to uh, qualify for study um, in, of piano, for instance. Well, they they, they there are three faculty currently to whom they might be assigned. Uh -huh. And I guess that what happens sometimes is that 
uh, some, often, often the, the student simply doesn't know how well he or she is going to interact with one teacher or another. Mm. But, but if it, and usually I think the, the original assignment takes because the, the faculty as a group listen to the student and think, well, okay, this person has specific kinds of interests, a particular approach to the instrument, and perhaps this teacher would be best equipped to, uh, to mentor the student, to guide the student along. But sometimes it doesn't work out, and then they have to switch them. Uh, yeah. It, this does happen. I, I mean, I don't. I don't know to what degree it does. I'm not really privy to those arrangements. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but other in other uh, areas, there, there might be just one faculty member. And so, uh, if, if yeah. you, want, you want to study violin or viola, say, uh, you know, there's there's this teacher, and that's that's it. So it's either going to work out or it's not. Yeah. I, I hear rumblings around the internet, um, people wishing, say, the, the core classes um, when you become a music major weren't mm -hmm. so Western Western focused. Um, and I do you do you feel like the music major um, world will respond to to these sort of interest in, you know, why do I need to do all this? Uh, you know, annoying um, ear training and, uh, you know, harmonic analysis in order to become a music um, music major. And, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that, that has been the bedrock, uh, I, I think, for uh, from what I understand, uh, at least my experience at the UW, that was at that time uh, very, there was a lot of focus on that. Um, do you, I mean, do you see that, uh, you kind of hinted at it earlier, but do you, do you see that over like changing to, be a little more um, lenient or or loose to the um, to the curriculum there. Well, um, for some uh, specialized there there, are, <clears throat> as you know, and I think most listeners will know this too. Uh, um, there the the music major uh, typical. Well, this, I think this is typical of any school is not a one size fits all mm. uh, uh, proposition. For example, <clears throat> you know, there are, there are various different ways that you can major in music at uh, that the, in the school of music at the UW. Uh, you, you, you can do a, you can do a straight uh, BM bachelor of music performance Degree. You could do a BA history option or a BA theory option, which involves a little, involves some differences in the elective portion of the curriculum. But for those three, the uh, the core is the same mm -hmm. across the board. Okay, um, most of the study studies of traditional instruments, the the teachers have pretty much held the line on that. They they uh, they don't want to see their uh, they, they don't. They don't want to see the, the curriculum watered down any further. And when I use the term watered down. That's already a value judgment, isn't it? Uh, but uh, but they don't want to. They don't want to see uh, anything further subtracted from the uh, the curriculum, which is already has already been compressed to a great deal. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a, on the other hand, if you are a music ed major or an, an ethnomusicology uh, major, then th those are those are different areas, and what they get is a kind of a they, they get um, what you would call I guess um, music theory light uh, experience. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, they they take they only go through the first year. They don't do a second year of study in in music theory. I hope I'm. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here. I think, but I believe that that's that's still uh, that's still the way it is uh, handled for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they don't. They they. In other words, they have their faculty have decided that there are more important things than a second year of music theory for them to uh, to take. So they they get that they get kind of that bare bones introduction that we're able to give them and. In the first three quarters, and then that's it. Right. Um, okay. 
So whether it will change more than that, that what, what you allude to is a kind of a thoroughgoing change in the curriculum, which would, which would integrate non, uh, study of non-Western uh, practices and uh, other, other perhaps um, uh, popular uh, vernacular uh, musics of, well, even of this country, um, not to mention other parts of the world into the curriculum. This is hard to envision, and it's not uh, w without it becoming a kind of a, the, the, the factor that has caused a certain amount of resistance to this idea is the idea that what you'll end up with is a, is a kind of a smorgasbord where everyone has a little smattering, a little taste of this, that, and the other thing, and I've never had a chance to build any particular kind of skill. Mm. Uh, and, and, the the idea being that even though uh, you 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 know you may walk out of your theory your core theory classes having completed them all with <clears throat> with a certain a certain degree of skill in voice leading and counterpoint and analysis of form and so on and never use them directly again because you're you're not going to be a theory teacher. You're not going to do. You're not going to elect advanced study in theory and go into that. You still will have a. An, a you'll still have an ability to deal with uh, the, the musical musical facts as they come across to you uh, uh, through your ears and as you see them on the on the written page. Uh, and this kind of skill is indirectly relevant to the study of other things, even if they haven't been directly covered in a core, core curriculum. Uh, this is one area in which we all feel as though things are, things are pretty well, th things are pretty well determined. It's been a long time since this was common practice, since this was a, a living practice, but it is still music that for one reason or another is still very important to our, our uh, larger musical culture. Though, granted, a lot of people stay away from it. They don't, they're, they're not that interested in going to classical music concerts or, or things like that. Yeah. But, it, but w w one thing that happened recently, and uh, you all may know about this, uh, there was a, uh, a an initiative formed by the College Music Society. Again, that that group that has a a very strong interest in pedagogy, uh, which was a kind of a task force to study the undergraduate music major. Um, T F U U M Task Force on the Undergraduate Music Major. Yeah, yeah I heard about this. So. T F U M. Yeah, and it was it was. Headed by a guy who, who is basically a jazz professor at the University of Michigan, and a lot of other people, including one of our faculty uh, here at the, at the UW, and they came up with uh, a, a a series of recommendations. The recommendations were all kind of in the what they ended up with was producing a kind of manifesto mm -hmm. without without any concrete suggestions for a new a new curriculum. And this was this was an initiative, as I said, sponsored by the College Music Society. But when the membership of the College Music Society read through it, there was a huge hue and cry about it. They just didn't like it. Hmm. And as a result, this manifesto is is now not uh, is is not endorsed by the College Music Society. You can't find a link to it on their web page. They've set it aside completely. So for the moment, that uh, initiative seems to be dead. I don't. I really. I really don't know what will happen uh, uh, subsequently. Is but it's quite possible because things things always change. They change eventually. There's no, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, that eventually some kind of change will occur. It's just that it doesn't seem as though there's a great deal of of, of uh, energy behind that right now. The traditional theory textbooks still sell in great quantities and they're used everywhere in in this country. I don't I don't know what the future really holds. I'm 
I have no reliable crystal ball for this. <laughs> And since and since I'm relatively close to retirement, I feel that this is probably not my <laughs> my fight. It's yeah. probably, probably not you know, something that's that my my younger colleagues, the next generation, will have to handle. Right. So another slight pivot here, and this is perhaps a more philosophical question, but what can music theory tell us about music? <laughs> Well, it, it again, it all kind of depends on what you want to get out of it. Uh, yeah. And and as I as I said, uh, the uh, I mentioned puzzle solving before. Uh, the the people who go into it only for the sake of that are probably not going to find much fulfillment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it, it has to be motivated by, uh, to my mind, anyways, uh, a really uh, uh, deep engagement with music in the first place. Most of, I think just about everyone who's ever been involved in music starts as a player. And even if you don't, uh, per, even if you drop that eventually, you're no longer um, uh, involved as a, as a performer, either as a singer or an instrumentalist in music, you still respond to it in a way that you originally did that, that got you seriously interested in pursuing uh, performance um, performance ability up to uh, you know a certain level whatever that level was mm -hmm. um, um, and so so that's where it that's where it all that that's where it all begins and uh, though it's not necessarily where it where it uh, has to end. Um, there are two basic philosophies, I think I could say, about of music analysis. One, one has to do with compositional procedure. There are a lot of people involved in analysis who start there. Um, the, uh, the, the idea being, they wanna know what the composer consciously did to put this or that piece together mm -hmm. and how, how this, how that composer, perhaps that composer's style and whole approach changed over time. And it's all very, very uh, directly oriented, very closely oriented to compositional procedure. But there's another philosophy that doesn't bother so much with that, uh, that feels that actually most composers, if you ask them, will say, well, you know, once the piece is out there, once it's, once it's, uh, once it's being played and is uh, being uh, absorbed by, received by the public, it's not my problem anymore. Mm. Uh, I, you know, it's up to, it lives a life of its own and it's up to the, it's up to musicians everywhere of whatever stripe to make sense of it. And uh, the, the, unless they're incredible control freaks, uh, and there are a few of them out there, uh, <laughs> unless they're incredible control freaks, they're not. They're, they will be willing to leave it at that. Say, okay, well, uh, whatever, whatever you can get out of it is fine. And and often, I mean, I've had this experience too with composers I've actually talked to whose music I've I've studied. Say well, you know, I never thought about that, but you're right. <laughs> that was happening there, uh, uh, and that's always kind of interesting. I don't know if I could call it. I guess it's gratifying uh, to to hear that. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a wonderful letter from from Jurgen Ligeti one time. Who, who, so I sent something to something to him, and uh, he said he said that yeah, many things in here really reflect the way I work. And other things were not conscious, he said. But but that doesn't really matter, you know. Mm -hmm. They're they're right, even even though I even though I didn't I didn't consciously plan anything like that. Yeah, that's very that's that's the kind of liberal attitude that I really appreciate, uh, and I think that it's true of a lot of uh, a lot of composers. They're delighted when anyone pays attention to their work at all. Uh, uh, and this is this is, uh, and you know it's it's good that that uh, that I guess that we're 
we're spending time with it and and uh, and uh, maybe depending on how widely any of our work is read which seems to me to be a somewhat dicey proposition there really aren't um, um, there, there uh, the the, audit, the the readership for a typical theory article is pretty small yeah um, um, you know, I get the feeling sometimes that the only people who are really reading my stuff are graduate students who are assigned it, who have to read it. Uh, and and, and that's, that's, a little, that's a little depressing, but, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, I, I don't know. But that's, that's what, you know, if I have to, if I have to say what, what, can, what can music theory tell us about music, uh, it tells, probably tells the person who's doing it more than any than any than anyone else uh, because you're the one you're the one who's really involved in it yeah and, and uh uh and if it gets if it happens to get someone else interested every now and then you know i encounter an undergraduate one of those up in one of those upper level electives who really seems to have more than an ordinary interest in the subject mm -hmm. and and i and i can kind of tell when someone has what i call the knack for this mm -hmm. and, and you know, I always try to pull that person aside and say look you know you, you know you really could this really could be your thing this mm -hmm. could be this could be what you do in life if you if you're really that interested in it sometimes yeah. sometimes it works sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you strike a spark that way yeah that's that's something I've been thinking about like why I why I personally got into music theory um, yeah, well, you're one of them. You're 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 one of you're one of the ones I thought I had the had the knack for it. You, you okay. haven't, you, you know, you pursued it as far as the master's level, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, I I actually came at it from a perspective of wanting to understand why I react so strongly to some music and why I don't to others. Hmm. It, was, it was more of like a why am I such a sucker for this kind of sound or thing? And, and why, why am I not into this other stuff? And, uh -huh. and as a kind of composer, sometimes um, it, it's a good way to take what I think I like and sort of execute it on paper and, and using my music theory chops that I've learned from you uh, along the way. To help do that, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't help but feel that my understanding of of music of music on a more technical level has maybe, in some sense, taken the magic away a little bit. If that makes if that mm -hmm. uh, resonates with you at all, or, or just just knowing that oh, I'm a I'm a sucker for a well placed you know major seventh chord <laughs> or or um or yeah. interval or something and uh, yeah. uh -huh. and so it, also in a way it has contributed to i think my my kind of evolution of musical taste and aesthetic um because i have this kind of du dual like this is what i like but wait this is all this is i'm gonna and then i there's this like kind of endless um cycle of revision i guess to my musical taste and i guess i'm wondering if you've experienced any of this um before sure yeah actually i have um though though the idea of of, of kind of dispelling the mystery um is not it's not something i have a i i can i really have a a, um, a, I haven't had I haven't had a strong experience with that. Mm. Uh, uh, that it does that doesn't bother me too too uh, terribly. Um, there are some things about well, we could talk about Arvo Parrot, which is I know a, a subject that's dear to your heart, mm -hmm. uh, as it is to at least at least a couple of people listening today. Um, uh, that uh, that I was actually surprised. When I started really working through those scores, at how um, how methodical the approach was, you can you can you can get that directly 
orally in some cases, but not in others. And it, it, get, it's, it varies a great deal depending on which score uh, you're looking at. But in a way, it didn't. It, it didn't. It didn't trouble me. It didn't trouble me too much. And some things that you learn from from score study are just amazing and actually moving. Uh, are when when uh, when I first started looking at uh, "I Am the True Vine." This is a piece by by Parrot. Um, listening to us, it, beautiful. Uh, the 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 way the the way the voices move and. It, it, but it didn't occur to me until I sat down and said, "Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a look at this." And it turns out, of course, there's a there's a cycle which is enacted about six times in the course of the piece. Uh, but but looking at the just looking at the notes on on the staff, I said, "Oh my gosh, what's going on here?" First, the first the the composite range rises, and then it, from a kind of a middle point. And it falls below the middle point all the way down and it comes back up and it goes high again and it's a vine. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's the true vine, all right. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it, and it's just and that that realization was just so uh, moving, you know, just that he would do that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and this is not something that I could have, you know. Uh, and maybe, maybe if I had listened to it a dozen times in succession, I finally would have twigged to it. Um, but, but the activity of of actually working on it on paper is what finally brought it uh, firmly to the fore. Huh. Now there was something else I wanted to say about about uh, uh, oh yes about repertoire that that. that uh, Attracted me for various reasons, but I couldn't tell. Yeah, this this is something that actually has has happened to me several times. I uh, I I got kind of kind of uh, um, trapped or tricked into uh, writing something on Frank Zappa. Uh, oh, okay. About about twenty. Let's see, how many years ago was this? Now, like twenty five years ago, I got I was a Approached by some, by a couple of colleagues from another from other schools who thought that that possibly I'd heard of Frank Zappa because uh, because Zappa had such a big interest in Varese, which was a very early interest of mine. Uh, well, in fact, I'd been listening to Frank Zappa since I was about 15 years old, and I thought I thought he was he was really interesting, but at the same time, because of that division between between uh, high art and low art uh, that was so was so important uh, back then back in my teenage years I had some kind of residual guilt about it as I felt so that maybe you know maybe this was a guilty pleasure of mine that wasn't really that wasn't really respectable somehow mm. uh, but by studying the music, Consciously, yeah, you know, I came to understand that, yeah, it was actually well worth study, and it was that it was tremendously interesting, even though it has that some parts of his work have flaws that are pretty hard to overlook, and they're flaws which which I which I've discussed in various various uh, publications. Another another uh, uh, realm of music that I had. Uh, initial trouble with was minimalism. Again, the feeling that this was somehow a guilty pleasure because I was just kind of getting off on the repetitions. You know, was kind of, oh yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really great. Uh, 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 and, I get it. Yeah. yeah, and and so it took some again study, kind of uh, brought these issues into a kind of of intellectual context where I could really deal with them. And, and the experience convinced me again that this was highly worthwhile as as music for study. Same thing with same thing with drone. I think when I, when I was, I was asked to contribute to a, a you know a, a, a multi-author volume, which was going to be about intersections between pop and art, that was the first thing I thought about. Uh, well, uh, 
yeah, drone. This is this is this is where I want to was where I want to go right now because again, I had some feelings. Is, is there really anything there to study? I mean, it's just these tones that just go on and on and on. What are we going to do with them? Uh, well, it turns out there's a lot you can do with them. Yeah. And, and it, it just takes paying attention to to do that. I think that, you know, pursued in the right way uh, and not letting yourself get get uh, uh, kind of penned in by by a specialized interest, which um, people are way too prone to do, unfortunately. But if you use it as a vehicle for uh, for expanding your horizons rather than narrowing them, you know you can you you know you can really live a very fulfilling life as a as a a, a, a music scholar. Just just uh, let your let your interests blossom in in uh, in various different ways, and don't worry too much about being the specialist who has to know everything about uh, a specific a specific topic or a specific subject yeah i've tried i've tried not to be that way though obviously you have to keep up mm -hmm. you have to keep up with current research in, in whatever you whatever area you're studying but but you don't have to let it uh, be your uh, exclusive focus yeah uh, we're just about to hit we're past the hour mark a little bit but i just wanted i wanted to comment on something that was profound for me when i was um studying at the uw and uh when we were i had these weekly lessons with you and and we were talking about our parents music and mm -hmm. um you know patterns uh, where patterns are everywhere um and what was profound for me was when you asked me well when do they when do they break you know that's yeah. and i think it didn't had it hadn't occurred to me that that to to talk about that would say more about the music than just kind of i mean you, you do have to dig into the to the patterns and to identify them and to kind of see what's happening there mm -hmm. but it was such it was such a a big moment for me of of kind of going the the next step. I think um, it's one thing just to go into analysis deep into something. You know, this kind of can be on on not just applied to music, but to many things in life, maybe. And and just to kind of keep digging around and just finding all sorts of stuff. But to to say you know well what you know what to to sort of talk about the limits of the things you can find um or in arvo parrot's case the limits of the pat the patterning um I, I just found that to be uh kind of mind mind blowing mm -hmm. so, uh thank you for that oh no you're, you're entirely welcome i'm i'm glad to know that in fact yeah, yeah. It's great so uh, any final words you want to say before we uh call this uh, call this good mm, well I guess I'll, all I'll say is, uh, you know, I I have a feeling that the I don't know I don't know exactly who's listening, but if there are any uh, silent partners out there who are uh, uh, are listening, and if I'm happy to talk to anyone uh, privately about um, about <clears throat> the prospects for. Uh, for music theory and music theorists in, in the coming years as I as I see them I'm not sure I have a you know any better idea than anyone else about what's going to happen but I, but I have some I have some ideas and if if uh, if anyone is contemplating advanced study I'd sure like to uh, hear from you uh, that would be that would that would be great uh, uh, and I might have some useful advice depending on what it is you want to know or what it is you want to do. Right. And I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, message me if you're interested in getting a hold of you. And uh, if you don't mind, Jonathan, I'll, I, I can send your, um, your UW address. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, yeah. Go right ahead. Yep. Jbernard at uw.edu. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll put, I'll link that in the description. And uh, the uh, Brian Jinshiel, Mark Powell, um, Brian, uh, 
good to good to see you all there on the chat. Um, yeah, and this this video will be available um, after we're done here live to circulate around um, if anyone would like to do that or if Jonathan, you'd like to do that too. Yeah, yeah, my daughter was, uh, I meant to ask you about this before we started. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my daughter uh, heard that I was going to, going to do a podcast and uh, she, uh, she, she was hoping that she would be able to listen to it after it was all done. So, oh yes. Uh, so yeah, please do, I'll forward her the, the link and so she can do that. Great. Well, thanks again, Jonathan, for being on the podcast. And yeah. um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, Yeah, I'm very happy to have done this. I hope I was reasonably coherent. Please, yeah, any any follow-up questions you have, uh, um, yeah, just send them along. I'll, I'll do my best to respond. Great. Thank you. All right. Take care. <laughs>